Are you a nice person? Here are some signs. In relationships, you're often the caregiver. And for all you're giving, you just seem to attract takers. You try to believe the best in people and give your best, yet you always feel let down and disappointed. You get repeatedly passed up for promotions and raises. And you don't understand why, because you're such a hard worker and you get along with everybody. You don't like conflict or being seen as a difficult person or a troublemaker. So when people don't like you or accept you, it hurts, maybe more than it does for others. Today, we're going to talk about what's wrong with being nice. And I'm going to start with something controversial. Basically, it's not going to sound nice. It's going to sound so bad, mean, and negative to some people that some of you are going to click away because it's going to rub you the wrong way. You're going to be like, oh, she's one of those. I can't listen to this. And you're going to click off. So you've been warned. But for the rest of you who are big boys and girls and know how to accept people who you don't agree with, buckle up. There's an important message coming up. Before we begin, let's get clear on what niceness is and isn't. With this quote from Marsha Sirota, she says, Kindness emerges from someone who's confident, compassionate, and comfortable with themselves. A kind person is loving and giving out of the goodness of their heart. At the root of extreme niceness, however, are feelings of inadequacy and the need to get approval and validation from others. So with that in mind, let's talk about forced niceness, which we see going on right now. Uh, there seems to be this false religion that's taken hold of our society. Some might call it the kindness cult, which I think is very spot on. And there's really always been a kindness cult. There's, this is nothing new. This has been going on for generations. You know, these are the people who tell you to play nice with others, even when they're not playing nice with you. And forgive them, even when they're not sorry. Let me give you one example. Right now, certain choices and people are becoming criminalized, not literally, but in the minds of many, for having individualized boundaries that are different from the group. The current group think is something along the lines of this. You're a sociopath or some other kind of bad person. If you don't wear a mask, have you seen these memes going around? By the way, this is gaslighting. And um, if you want to know more about that, you should check out my video titled, Are You Being Gaslit? And I've written a book on this in case you're interested. I've got links below. But, you know, why are we criminalizing people who individuate from group think? In other words, why do we criminalize politically incorrect people? I mean, in the example I gave you, perhaps the non-maskers have a health condition and need to breathe freely. Perhaps they read the label on the box of masks showing that the CDC says they actually don't protect from COVID. Perhaps they are perfectly healthy people and have taken measures to boost their immune systems naturally. And perhaps they're actually good people who want to live in faith, not fear, and set a good example for others to do the same. Now, rather than see things this way, suddenly society has branded these people as a bad person or bad people or sociopath for not wearing a mask during a pandemic, which statistically is not worse than the swine flu. Oh, but I wouldn't want to make anyone sick, the do good or say. But what if wearing the mask doesn't actually do any good because it doesn't actually guarantee protection as the label on the box and the CDC says? What if wearing a mask is more for psychological reasons than health reasons? What if wearing a mask actually lowers your immunity because you're not getting fresh air as some doctors suggest? If all those what ifs are true, then wearing a mask is being done to avoid conflict, avoid being seen as a bad person or a sociopath, 
and to accommodate other people's irrational fears. And this is also that others can have a false sense of security while compromising our own immunity, spreading fear, and polluting the planet. Now, agree or disagree with my example, because I know it was a controversial one that some of you didn't like to hear. You got felt maybe confronted with my beliefs or my thoughts. But there are many more examples of how we can't be giving open and tolerant without boundaries. We can't be giving open and tolerant in a group without individual boundaries, or it won't be a healthy dynamic. Right, I can't let the group dictate what makes me a nice person or a sane person. (laughs) Or the next thing they're going to have me doing is wearing a body condom to go out in public. You see, life without boundaries is a terrible, crazy-making one. If you don't decide for yourself where you draw the line on others dictating your behavior, then others will decide and dictate it for you. Either way, it's not going to feel nice. By the way, I mentioned in my book that when you set and maintain boundaries, you're going to piss people off. Oh, they're going to call you mean, negative, so on. That's why it's hard, especially if you're a codependent or an empath. We don't want to upset people. We don't want to offend them. We don't want to lose relationships. That's why we don't set and maintain healthy boundaries. And more importantly... That's why we're narc magnets. Let me show you how this works. The kindness cult, also known as the ministry of truth in some circles. (laughs) Hat tip to George Orwell. (laughs) What they do is they gaslight you. They tell you to be nice to toxic people, like you're not good enough or smart enough to decide for yourself who to be nice to and when. Can't you just be nice? You know, they're going through a hard time. I'm sure they didn't mean it. Be the bigger person. Set the example. Yeah, they say things like that. Here's the problem. If you're dealing with a narc or someone displaying traits of narcissism, they aren't trying to learn from your good example. They're trying to exploit it. And what the kindness cult wants is for you to pretend like nothing bad is happening here. And if it is, find a nice way. A group approved way to call out repeat offenders on their BS, if at all. (laughs) Again, the problem with this is that repeat offenders get away with their toxic behavior all the time. And then we wonder why. How do they get away with that? Well, it's because people are too damn nice. Pretending like nothing bad is happening. And, you know, walking around on eggshells, afraid of upsetting and offending people. And this approach of trying to manage other people's emotions for them enables and emboldens toxic people to continue. Reminds me of that quote that goes something like, evil prevails because good men do nothing. You got to do something. And that's good. But, you know, evil's not going to think it's good, right? To avoid enabling, we've got to stop dressing ugliness up in prettiness. It's better for us to disengage, maybe minimize interactions with these people or flat walk away if you can. The point is, give your kindness discriminately, discerningly. And that's what the false religion of the kindness cult isn't preaching. They want you to give out kindness indiscriminately, without any discernment at all. That's what makes their doctrine dangerously deceptive. To stop toxic behavior, it needs consequences. Without real consequences and accountability, the toxic behavior will continue. And like I say in my book, why wouldn't it? I mean, if it's working for them, they're going to keep working it. So kindness shouldn't be blindly given, especially to repeat offenders. Give kindness when it's earned and warranted. But if you listen to the kindness cult, they will shame you for doing this by guilting you about what other people think and pressuring you to manage other people's emotions and feelings for them. And when you don't, you're going to be a bad person. 
Today's toxic positivity is coming from a lot of messages in society such as see the good in everyone. And, you know, if you come from a Christian background, as do I, um, we get messages like do unto others as you would have done unto you. Uh, we serve the God of second chances, which a narcissist will interpret as, you know, million chances. <laughs> And yeah, there are even scriptures that, that say, you know, you, you know, to forgive seven times, 70 times. Oh, I address that in my book, by the way, these scriptures are taken out of context. But nevertheless, we keep hearing these messages all throughout society in the new age community. Sounds a little something like this. Find your bliss, live your bliss. And then if you want to start talking about this problematic behavior, oh, you have bad energy or your frequency is low. And, you know, regardless of spirituality, there are just people who have the mindset that they don't want to hear about it because that's going to bring them down. And that's just too negative. In the right context, these sayings can be right on. They can be good. In the wrong context, they're bad. We have to realize that toxic people maintain power and dominance because they're being enabled. Who are the enablers? The toxic positivity people who are members of the kindness cult. They want to believe the best in others, which seems noble on the surface. But they become the flying monkeys who work on behalf of narcissists or people demonstrating narcissistic traits or toxic behaviors, basically. They work on behalf of those people to silence, shame, and basically gaslight you for giving your kindness with discernment. Here are some things that toxic positivity peeps say. I don't like the negative energy. You just need to speak positive affirmations. <laughs> Some of these people can really have the most childlike hope, which on one hand is really remarkable, okay? But I want to remind you, particularly for those of you who take any stock in the Bible, ageless, timeless wisdom, you know, there's a scripture that says, be innocent as doves, wise as serpents. Well, these people have the innocent as doves part, but somehow the wise as serpents part just totally got forgotten or knocked off of there. Another thing that positive, toxic positivity peeps will say is love heals. All you need is love. It's a very, you know, hippie idea, right? Unfortunately... There's some kind of inherent denial of free will when they say that, you know, love is a choice. It really is. I mean, if you don't get to choose love, it's not real. And yeah, these people have the choice to accept your love or reject it. Another thing they say is just forgive. And we see this in, you know, the New Age community and the Christian community. For the New Agers, you know, it's about that forgiveness fairy dust. In the, the Christian community, it's about waving your word of God wand. They don't seem to realize that when you're dealing with narcissists, forgiveness equals permission. Oh, I'm sure there were some good times, people will say. And this is a way of deflecting from the bad times, which you're trying to address in order to solve the problem, right? Oh, nobody's entirely bad. They're minimizing, you know. Oh, let's focus on the good, right? Well, you know, that's not really going to solve the problem. Another common saying uh, in the Christian community is God is in control. And the New Age version of this is trust the universe. Oh, you know, guess what? We're all going to die. You can trust in that. <laughs> Pretty negative, huh? But it's the truth. My, my, my issue with this is that, um, you know, whether you're coming from the Christian perspective or the New Age perspective, the end result is that these beliefs foster helplessness. You waiting on the universe or God to deliver your faith. And it fosters a fantasy that maybe the toxic person will eventually change 
I don't know, if you wish upon a star, if the stars align magically, or, you know, if the angels orchestrate it behind the scenes. And I got to say this to those of you who have a Christian background, as do I. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you. God is in control. But read the rest of those scriptures. Read it in the full context. God is in control, but in his sovereignty, he gave you dominion over certain things in your life. Without free will, you have no choice. Without choice, you're just a robot and cannot even choose to love. Oh, but you have loved, haven't you? I digress. Let's get back on topic. Why do toxic positivity peeps say these things? Well, have you noticed lately that there's a war on judgment these days, even though we rely on judgment every day to save our lives, like, you know, looking both ways before crossing a street? Unfortunately, the positivity police won't openly judge or use labels to call out toxic behavior for what it is. Oh, not unless they're gaslighting, which is calling out toxic behavior that isn't, but that's a whole nother subject. Anyway, the reason they do this is because doing so, judging can feel judgmental or bad, you know, to talk about people or talk about toxicity. And doing that means they'll have to examine their own toxicity. See, it's projection. They don't want to feel judged, so they don't openly judge. It's their issue. It's their toxicity, not yours. So again, I go back to saying, don't accommodate it with indiscriminate kindness. Here's the challenge. Being clear and on point with others isn't always going to feel good. Often enough, it's going to feel negative, blunt, harsh, or at least other people will feel that way about it. But it's what's needed in order to find a positive outcome after dealing with people who are truly negative because they're toxic. When you have to edit your words to fit a more positive and good feeling message for others, for example, basically managing their emotions for them, it's disrespectful for you and them because it's requiring you to abandon yourself in the truth. It's requiring you to not be authentic and it gets you into fake relationships with fake people. Realize in a healthy relationship, abandoning yourself and the truth isn't an option. But if it's required in order for you to have a relationship with someone, then your relationship is toxic. As mentioned earlier, people who are indiscriminately kind are people who try to manage others' emotions for them. By not upsetting them or offending them, they attract and enable toxic people such as narcissists who crave the unmerited admiration and adoration that nice people give. Another unintended consequence is that not only does it trash your personal relationships, it also trashes your career prospects. Did you know that studies have shown that people who are high in agreeableness often don't get promoted to managerial positions? Conversely, people who are high in disagreeableness often do. This is why many people in high-level positions demonstrate narcissistic character traits. And if you want to know more about this, by the way, check out Jordan Peterson's content here on YouTube about that. I know this information is counter to what many of us have been taught from elementary school. We were graded on our conduct and our ability to play well with others. Some of us would get into big trouble with parents and teachers if we didn't. And especially for women, we grew up with a lot of messaging about how nice girls don't fill in the blank. <laughs> and how girls are made of sugar, spice, and everything nice. Well, I mean, in theory, that sounds nice now, doesn't it? But in reality, it's more like a nightmare for agreeable people who get passed up for promotions and raises by disagreeable ones climbing to the top. Here's the problem. Agreeable people judge. Yes, they do. Not openly, not overtly, but they do. And they do so based on feelings. And they often make up excuses for failure. The solution here is 
being conscientious by judging based on accomplishments, not feelings. This is about judging based on the actions, not the intent. Well, I meant to, or I didn't mean to, well, what actually happened? That's what we need to make a judgment call on. And we've also got to understand that in business, high level performance is often in conflict with inclusivity and sensitivity. We've got to find the right balance between people feeling good and doing what has to be done in order to win, which often doesn't feel good. Jordan Peterson said it's complicated for people who are both agreeable and conscientious. In his words, he said, my experience in large institutions has been that if you want to hire someone to exploit productively, you hire middle-aged women who are hyper conscientious and hyper agreeable because they'll do anything. They won't take credit for it and they won't complain. And that's nasty. And it happens all the time. And I think one of the things you have to be careful of if you're agreeable is to not be exploited. How do you not get exploited? Jordan Peterson says, you need assertiveness training. You need to have the ability to negotiate on your own behalf. You need to say what you think and tell the truth about what you think, even if it seems nasty and harsh, especially if it's a truth and a message that needs to be delivered. The trouble here is that agreeable people don't like conflict, even though not all conflict is bad. Agreeable people just want to smooth things over. And if you're highly sensitive and you hate conflict, even if it's required to solve problems, and it often is, then you're only avoiding conflict over the short term, not the long term. It's a very short sighted strategy. The solution is that we've got to recognize that some conflict is good and can be used for good and accept that some problems aren't just going to go away. They must be discussed. So get a long-term strategy to tackle conflict and tension and relationships sooner than later. Also realize that disagreeable people know what they want and how to get it. If you don't level up to knowing the same for yourself, then you're going to be seen and treated as a doormat. This is the danger of being too agreeable. People who are too agreeable often don't know what they want because they're accustomed to living through other people. They're other focused and other referential. So they look to others for validation to know what they want. They find it harder to know their own desires apart from the affirmation of others. In some cases, yeah, being other focused and knowing what others want is advantageous, but not if you're trying to forge your own way in a competitive career, according to Peterson. I know some of you have thought within yourselves, but I get along with everybody. Well, that's the problem. News flash, and I learned the hard way. Upper management doesn't want that. Contrary to what your parents and teachers taught you, upper management needs you to be willing to play bad cop while they play good cop. And if you can't do that, then you're probably in the wrong line of work or leadership is something that will always evade you. That's the ugly truth. I'm not going to dress it up in prettiness. But if you present yourself as determined and assertive, people won't mess with you, or at least they will a whole lot less. As Peterson says, you need to grow some teeth and show them when necessary. Let people know you can bite and bite hard when necessary. You don't have to bite them, but they need to know that you can and will. Otherwise, people who are badly socialized, and many are, these people will keep encroaching upon you and your boundaries until you wall yourself off from them entirely. These are people who hate the word no and can't take no for an answer. Oh, they're all over the place. Life is gonna afford us plenty of opportunities for dealing with people who have no boundaries and learning from this. These are people who aren't going to have boundaries unless they're imposed upon them. And if you won't impose boundaries upon them because you're a nice person, then what's going to happen? As a child, you get bullied. As an adult, you don't get promotions and raises because you can't say no. You're a go along to get along. 
And upper management will see you not as a leader, but as a follower. And your co-workers and others will credit themselves for your hard work. And then you're going to be angry for giving your best and never having things go your way. Why? Because you're basically a pushover. You're a nice person. Well, if you want to know why you're doing this and how to stop it, especially in the context of personal relationships, make sure to watch part two of this video where I'll cover those questions along with tips on how to practice genuine kindness that brings long-term success. Oh, and if you haven't subscribed and activated the bell for notifications so that you're being notified of when that becomes available, make sure to do so now. Till next time, wishing you guys all the best. Be blessed.